one thing have I asked of the Lord? What's the one thing you keep asking of the Lord? If I could read a transcript of your prayers for the last few weeks, what would I see as the one thing that you just keep asking for? Would it be, God, just let me dwell in the house of your Lord all the days of my life. Let me just gaze upon your beauty and inquire in your temple. Let me just meditate in your temple. Let me just gaze upon your beauty. God, it's you. Is that what your transcripts would say to me? I mean, it's simplistic, isn't it? He just says, God, I just need to be with you and everything will be fine. It's simplistic, but do you see the obviousness in it? Like, well, of course. If I believe that there is only one sovereign being, the only ruler, the only sovereign, then isn't it obvious that as long as I am close with him, abiding in him, that's all I really need to do. The fruit will come, the protection will come, everything else will happen, it's obvious. I, I, I want to just gaze upon you and just go, I'm in love with Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ is in love with me right now. I mean, the God of the universe. I mean, isn't it just the most amazing thing when, when he answers prayer and you just think, I just spoke to God. God just listened to me and he answered me. Is there anything better than that on this earth? Man, what's better than that? Like I, this little human, this little screw up, this one that doesn't even pray as hard as the other guys, the one that doesn't know as much theology as some of these guys. I'm trying everything else, but I, I fail and I fail and I fail. But then, God, you heard me, you listened to me, you love me. That's the that's one thing I ask for that I will seek after. I'm just going to ask for it. I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to go after this. God, the, here's this one thing. It's just that, that I would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Those are important thoughts. God, you heard me. God, you listened to me. God, you love me. Like what would be in your prayer transcript, I wonder? I want to spend some time today challenging us a little bit, and uh, if you want to open your Bibles up to uh, 2 Peter, we're going to spend a, our time there in chapter 1, and I will say good morning to those in green in South Umpqua, glad you could join us. And I want to make sure that uh, we do something today, that we not only listen, but that we reflect and really think, what is it perhaps that God would impress on your heart today that as you leave you might be moved to action about. And so we're going to start in 2 Peter. And I think to begin, I think we need to understand something. One, so we're reading from the Bible. We have to remember that this is God's word, and we believe that from the cover to cover, it is truth, and it is inspired by him, and he writes through humans. And yet in that, we have humans who have their personalities, and we have their stories connected to their writing. And so I want you to think about Peter. If you don't know who Peter is, read the New Testament and just watch and see as he does many things that I would probably do even worse. <laughs> but he is Peter. And, you know, first thing you need to know is he must be top-notch because he's a fisherman like myself. So that's a pretty good clue that you can trust everything he has to say. He never has to lie about anything he catches or anything. And so... I trust this guy, but, but really as I watch and I see in Scripture how he interacts with Jesus, I kind of go, hmm, he's going to write to us, and God's going to work through him, but he's going to challenge us in a way that I think is important to know his background. Fisherman, he's a guy that walked on water because Jesus said, step out of the boat, that's a pretty life-changing experience, I would think. And by that moment, I would think that most humans would say, okay, I get it, you're God, I've got this. But it goes on, and, and he ends up rebuking Jesus further on in their time together. As Jesus lays out a plan where he has to die, and this is going to happen, and he's, so he's going to God and saying, no, it's not going to happen. It's a pretty bold, bold move. <laughs> not sure I would have done that, but maybe I would have. 
And then there's another time where there's this temple tax that has to be paid. And since he's a fisherman, I think Jesus knows his heart. And he says, ah, I know where some money is. Go down there, you're going to catch a fish. The first one you catch, there's a coin that'll help pay that tax. So he does. Again, it must have just blown his mind. These things keep happening. These, what is going on? But it goes on. And, and because he cares for Jesus, Peter's the one who draws the sword in the garden on that night when he's betrayed and takes a swipe and hits the ear of that person who's there to arrest. And then, of course, the famous Peter. Wouldn't you love to have statues of a rooster to remind you and the rest of the world that you denied your Savior? three times that night. That's Peter who's writing. That's the Peter who's going to say, I want to tell you a little bit about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is the Peter who was challenged many times and heartbroken, I'm sure, and then relieved to know that at the resurrection, Jesus still wanted to hang out with Peter. That's a pretty big deal. And so he starts writing. So follow with me and uh, let's take a minute and let's think about what this means. He's going to challenge us to action. He's going to challenge us to evaluate. And he starts here and he says this, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be to yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Then he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires." And for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. This list, although isn't an exhaustive list, it's not a numerical list we'll look at, but it is a list of importance that he says add to. But he starts with something. And he says this, this precious faith. He says, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior have received a faith as precious as ours. You know, that picture of that baby is it's precious, right? And this idea when we held children, they're, they're precious to us. And I, I think even in life, the things that we find precious, whether or not we can hold them, maybe they've grown up or maybe they're bigger than we can fit, those things that we invest in and find precious, I think in a way we can hold and like almost push into our heart this picture. And I want to challenge, and I want to pause, and I want to take a minute and ask you to think, is your faith precious to you? Because as you'll see today, if your faith is precious, you will want to add to it, and it will cause you to move into action. Is your faith precious? Well, what do you mean? How do, we, how do we evaluate this? Well, let's start with where faith came from, the creator of all. You see, we, we believe that God created everything. And Genesis, the first book of the Bible, tells the creation story. How God desired to create, and then he does something amazing. He is so powerful, he speaks. And trees are formed, and light, and earth. He's so powerful that he then comes to humans, and he could have spoke, but he said, no, I I want something different. The human race is going to be special to me. It's going to be precious to me. And so if you read in Genesis, it says that he formed man, kind of a hands-on experience, and he breathed life into them. That's a relationship move. That's not a God who says, eh, humans, make it. He says, this is precious to me. And then we read that they spend time, he and his creation, Adam and Eve, walking in the garden in perfect relationship, in a perfect environment, and that's what God desired. But he said, I need these humans who I love to love me genuinely. And so he gave them a choice. And there was that tree, and there was God. And they chose the tree. 
And because of that, we know sin entered the world and it severed that relationship that God desired and designed and now it was severed. Not by his surprise, however, but it was severed, and he wanted to continue that relationship. And, and we read, and history goes on, and time goes on, and we get to this amazing story where the Israelites get, they get a, taken out of Egypt, and they're in the desert, and God wants to dwell with them. So he hangs out in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, but then that wasn't enough. He says, I want you to build something for me so I can dwell with you. Build this tabernacle, and it's going to cost you financially, and it's going to be really extravagant because it's not going to be a cardboard box. I'm the creator of the universe. It's going to be special, and you're going to need to take care of it, and I want to dwell with you. And then you read Leviticus, and a lot of people read Leviticus, I think, with an angry God. You can't eat this. Wash this way. Get out of the camp if you do that. And on, instead of a loving God who said, so that I can dwell with you, you have to follow some of these things. Otherwise, if you come into my presence, you will die. Because that relationship that was severed in sin, it can't exist with me. But man, I want to be with you so bad. And so he reaches down and he dwells with them. And then we get to another amazing moment that you just celebrated. Christmas. The story of God in Philippians, emptying himself, it says, emptying himself to dwell amongst us in a baby's body, totally dependent on sinful humans to care for the creator of the universe, the God who holds you and can make you disappear, <laughs> who breathes as we sing oftentimes, who breathes into us his breath. But something more amazing happens. Not only does we, we know the story, if we read he, he lives this life of perfection, dies on a cross, rises again, and then does something even more profound. He says, now you will be my temple, and I will dwell in you by my spirit. That's precious. I think we need to pause and we need to see, do we really hold the preciousness of our faith, or do we just kind of throw it around and act like the ticket's punched and all is good? Or do we say, wait a minute, God who spoke everything into existence wants to dwell in me and then work with me and then through me? I think Peter knows what precious faith is. And I think he wants us to say, oh, don't just throw this around. This is important. And so we, we have this picture of God continually reaching and reaching and reaching. I want to be with you. I want to know you and I want you to know me. And it blows my mind and I think, okay, if my faith is really precious, then I better ask the next question, am I adding to my faith? Because if things are precious, we add to them. What do you mean? Well, my wife and I, my wife is precious to me. And when we got married, you know, we have immense love for each other, and we felt like we want to share that love, and so we add to our family because we had more out, outpouring to give, and so our family grew, and these precious boys came in to the world, and whoosh, there they are. And I still hold them here, not physically, of course, but they're precious to me, and we add, and we add to sharing love with others, and this whole idea is, if it's something is precious, we add to it, we continually pursue it, and we made that wise choice of the, the prudent financial decision of raising children. It won't cost us anything. It won't cost us sleep or time or anything. It's just going to be like this miracle of joy and bliss, right? And they come into the world, and they Real, make me realize how selfish I was and still am, and I hate that. But I love them. And so we continue to invest, and our finances went to them because they're precious. <laughs> and those late nights, the sleep went to them <laughs> because they're precious. And I, and I think what will be challenged by Peter is, are we adding to our faith? And so he gives us a list. Let's, let's look at this list. I, I want you to think through these things. Maybe you'll write them down. If I go too fast, you've got the Bible to go look them up again. It'll be good. But here's the first one he says. He says, add to your faith goodness. In other words, I think the first reason he said this is 
I believe. You've been given a conscience. God already gave you that before you knew him. Start choosing what you know is right. If it's precious to you, begin to choose a high moral character so that the people at work know there's something different about you. And he says, while you're doing this, add knowledge. You should be reading my word and spending time with me, not, not out of an obligation, but because of a sincere desire. And then he goes on and he says, uh, self-control. You see, as your knowledge increases, as you're making the effort to make good choices, the Holy Spirit will work with you to help you in self-control to make those good choices. We'll work together and we'll continue and then we'll get to my least favorite thing, perseverance. I don't want to go through things that I have to persevere. Like I just want to hang out and enjoy fellowship with my Savior. And he says, it's not going to work that way. You see, there's going to be financial troubles potentially and there's going to be illness and People are going to die unexpectedly, and I want you to have joy in those seasons, and I want you to look back and see how I worked. And as you persevere, the next one will come, and you'll say, I can make it because I know the strength in me, and my faith is being added to. And then he says godliness. Two really key points, I think. One, a healthy fear of God. A lot of people don't like that idea. I thought he was loving and great. Yeah, but he still holds you like this. And you could be gone. (laughs) And I believe, and it's stated pretty clearly, we all will bow before him. And I think we will crawl at his feet. I don't think we'll be high-fiving him at that first moment. What's up? I don't think so. I think it'll be, whew. Man, I can't believe I'm in the presence of the creator. And so I live in a healthy fear that says, you do hold all things You hold all things, and I respect that tremendously, and I fear that that you are in control. And out of that, I have a life of worship, that, that a godly life of worship, that my finances, my time, my world around me is being influenced for good and for the kingdom because of my worship. And then, of course, this next thing that starts to happen, he says, basically start caring for people. Ah. Man, but I'm so good to care for myself. I've been struggling just to keep myself happy, keep myself taken care of. Now i got to have mutual affection? He says, yeah, it's going to get worse. Now I need you to love people. And Jesus says it very strongly, including your enemies. And Jesus showed how to do that from the cross when he said, forgive them. In the midst of agony, forgive them. We begin to love, and it changes who we are, and I, and I think it shows in the lives we live, and I was, came across this story. This is a story by, it's about a, a girl named Brooke Bronski, and Brooke was 12 years old, and when she was 12, she became so passionate about Jesus that she began babysitting to raise money, and she would spend that money on Bibles to give to her lost unbelieving friends and anybody else she could come in contact with. And she was being so successful and running out of Bibles so quickly that local pastors began to bring her cases of Bibles to put into her, in her garage. So she no longer had to work to get them, but she just was able to go evangelize. You're like, man. And then she writes this little essay at 12 years old. It says, since I have my life before me, and it says this, it says, I will live my life to the fullest. I'll be happy, I'll brighten up, I'll be more joyful than I've ever been. I will be kind to others. I will loosen up. I will tell others about Christ. I will go on adventures and change the world. Can you hear that 12-year-old? Change the world. I'll be bold and not change who I really am. I'll be one of those people who go somewhere with a mission, an awesome plan, an aw- a world-changing plan, and nothing will hold me back. I'll set an example for others. I'll pray for direction. I'll have my life before me. I will give others the joy I have, and God will give me more joy. I'll do everything God tells me to do. I'll follow in the footsteps of God. I will do my best. Imagine if she could keep that passion right? And she did for two more years. And at 14, died in a car wreck. And you think, man, what is going on? The end of that story is her funeral when 1,500 people show up, though. And at that 
funeral, 200 come to the altar at the front of the stage. Students that she was close to, people that knew her, came to receive Christ, and those books of Bibles, those boxes were delivered and given to those people. And, I, and I'm challenged by that because I think, am I holding my faith precious enough that it's moving me to action so that when my last breath comes, I don't care how many came to a funeral, but I do care what the impact was. Will people say, I want to know who Jesus was because of him? Because of the way he responded, I want to know because he has something I don't or she has something I don't. And so we, we talked, and Pastor Will mentioned this idea that, you know, working with the Holy Spirit is like riding a bike, and I want to I make this a little more difficult. It's like riding a bike uphill, <laughs> right? Riding the bike uphill stinks. But see, he, Peter says, add to your faith. So like a push on the pedal, I will make an effort to choose good, and the Holy Spirit will help me to make the self this, the, that self-choice, and you'll give me that self-discipline to do it. And we work together, and it's not okay to coast, because coasting uphill is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. And what you find is backwards motion, right? And he says, add to it. And another thing you can do on a hill is you can push and just hold the bike. If you're really talented, and you can balance and just hang out there. And he says, that's not going to cut it, because that's not adding to that's stalled, that's stuck. Keep going, and it's hard, and it, you're going to have to persevere, he says. Keep adding to these things, and this is what starts to happen. And I experienced this in my life. It says, you know, our motivation changes from guilt to love. I grew up in the Catholic Church, but really came to faith and really surrendered my heart, so I went from my head knowledge to the heart of God here at Family Church, and in my walk, what I realized was as I pushed on the pedals of adding to my faith, God started to do some things that I frankly didn't like right off the bat. Went to watch one of my favorite movies, and I was kind of disgusted by it. I was like, well, what happened here? I was, I was adding to my faith, and he says, yeah, but uh, remember that self-discipline thing? <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't be watching those. And I was like, ah, you win. <laughs> okay, I'll add to my faith. I'll, give, I'll choose good, and I won't watch these movies. And then he attacked my music. Oh, again. But I was adding, and I was growing, and I was changing what I was listening to. I was changing what I was watching. I was listening and studying, and then it was like, it's time to move to action. How can you serve? How can you give? How about your finances, Craig? Let's start talking about that. Where's your heart? Where's your treasure? So I push on the pedal and he pushes. And I'm here to tell you, I am not there yet. I'm still on the hill, okay? I'm closer to the top, but I'm still on the hill. I have not reached the summit, and that neither have you. Sorry to burst your bubble, right? And when we reach heaven, then the work will be complete. And so I'm reading this book with a friend, Francis Chan's Crazy Love, and here's what he says, and this kind of challenges my thinking. He says, the irony is that while God doesn't need us but still wants us, we desperately need God but don't really want Him most of the time. He treasures us and anticipates our departure. If I could add, He sees us as precious and He wants us from this earth to be with Him and we wonder indifferently how much we have to do for Him to get by. What do I have to do for God to get by? Is, did I pray enough? Not, oh man, I want to just hang out with you, but did I pray enough? Oh, I just love to read your word and learn who you, uh, did, I, did I read enough this week? Did I do enough to get by so that you might shine on me with favor? Am I really adding to my faith or am I just on the hill or am I coasting backwards, which is really hard to do? On your seats, <clears throat> there's a card I'd love for you to pick up, and this is an introduction to Jacqueline Jordy. We've talked about her before, but she's another person that kind of challenges my thinking. And I think about, interestingly enough, at the age of 12, she came to faith, much like the girl in our story earlier. 1962, Jacqueline was born in Switzerland, and this is what I think is important to hear. The first thing she says is, 
We, my four sisters and I, we grew up in a Christian home, and that is a huge bonus. But sadly, that's not enough, because a lot of times we think we're Christians, and we're, well, we, we marked it on a tax form. Okay, well, we're Christians. We're good. But this is what she says. She says, and the one thing that impressed me, so parents, listen up, grandparents, parents-to-be, young kids, someday, you don't think you will, but someday you may be a parent, so listen up. She says this, the one thing that impressed me was that my parents not only spoke about God, but they lived out what they believed. And the result, she says, this made it clear to me that it was true. See, the parents were adding to their faith. The kids were seeing the adding, and they were moved. And so what does Jacqueline do? She gets so inspired to follow God, she ends up uh, becoming a nurse and serving in nursing missions, finds herself in Cambodia, and then works with some people we've heard of before, the Kellers, in the translation work of the Krung, and now is the lead person for the Brow Bible translation. And so there's a lot of adding to her faith. Single woman living in a jungle, uh, and to get to the town, to the town she's in, it's a nasty road in the winter. Almost impassable. I mean, it's terrible. And she's out there. And so what we're going to do next week is we're going to give you some more information about what it was like for us in 2006 when we adopted the Krung. And we're challenging Family Church to not just go to Green, not just go to South County, but to extend again into Cambodia and adopt another people group called the Brow and support them financially, prayerfully, through visitations and caring for them so that they too someday will have a precious faith so they can be moved to action so they can go and add to their faith as well. For those of you who remember signing this, we'll get another chance to sign a new one. So I pray in this week you might think about what that means to to make some conscious effort to, to pray for and to commit to caring for a people that you may never meet. Ultimately, what I think Peter is telling us is, if your faith is precious, you will add to it and it will move you to action. And this really stood out to me because I see this happen and I think it's, it's a dangerous place we can all fall into. He says this, he says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, remember the qualities we listed, right? If you possess them in increasing measure, that's forward progress up the hill, He says, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what I hear him saying is, it is good to have knowledge. But if that's all you're doing, that is not forward momentum. If you think it's one more Bible study that's going to, what you need before you can share your faith, I think he would challenge that today and say, no, 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 no. You may not have it all figured out, but how much do you really need to know? God came from heaven, dwelt in man, died, rose again. His name is Jesus, and he's how you find salvation. Okay, you want to talk some more? Let's start reading. Let's go for it. Let's figure it out together. I think we have to get to this point where we say, just studying his word is not what you're called to do. Sitting in church is not necessarily being the church. He says, move to action. Add to your faith. If it's precious, you will add to it. And so ending our year, 2018, comes to an end. And so we have our spiritual pathway, and I think it'd be good if the course of this week you sat and thought through. If you are a seeker still, maybe it's time to get on the bike and Put some faith in action and start trusting Jesus. But maybe you've been thinking, wow, I, I'm, I'm still reading a lot. I'm really not investing my time or my treasures. I'm really not, really not doing that. Maybe it's time. How did you do this year? I, I challenge you to think, where are you on your spiritual pathway? And then where do you believe God might call you to be in the year to come? What does 2019 look like? What is that going to look like? I'm going to release to both our campuses. Love you guys. See you soon. So I have a very simple next step. 
Oh, it's so, it's so easy. It's just simple. Just add to your faith, right? What is God calling you to add to your faith? It might turn into a long list, right? In a few minutes, I'm going to pray for you, and I'd love for you to really wrestle with this this week. You've got the devotions to walk through and really spend some time this week asking the question, how precious is my faith? But then what do I need to add to it? If it really means that much to me, am I really taking care of it? Am I really shepherding and adding to and investing? Is this really something I'm doing or am I just putting it on the mantle and each week grateful that I know Jesus? What does that look like? And, and I think it's important. This is a, a real critical step. So here we go. Go ask God what he would like you to add. And then listen. Listen. That's really hard. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the life of Peter, that he is just like us. I thank you that in his challenge, we hear your words ringing in our hearts that we are to add, that you are precious and you're worth everything we have. You're worth every penny that you give us. You're worth every second that you breathe into us. What do you call us to add to our faith, God? I pray that you would impress that on each person's heart, that they would hear that, that they would know, and then they would see 2019 and they would say this was an exciting year. At the end of 2019, God, may each of us look back and see what you've done as we add to our faith and you push the pedal of the bike with us, God. We thank you. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life. That's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can... Uh, Give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.